First thing I'm going to do is, uh, does anyone have any announcements that you want to let the church know about that's happening this next week? No? Okay. So if not, um, uh, Pastor Charlie will be back next week. And um, we want to remember our 40 Days of Community, which were a series that we're going to be doing shortly here. And there's just a short video clip here of that this morning. And I can't fill at home. The water the seeds of purposes that were planted in our lives through the first campaign. 40 days of community is a next step in your spiritual growth for you and your small group. And as I said, the fundamental question in 40 Days of Community is, what on earth are we here for? We're going to talk about how do we fulfill God's purposes, which we talked about in the last campaign. How do we do it together? How do we do it in community? How do we do it as a small group and as a church in our local community? During the next six weeks, you'll discover practical, real-life answers to that question. And you're going to make the discoveries about community in the context of community. See, this isn't just a lecture time. It's going to be a laboratory time, and the laboratory uh, is your church community and your small group community and your neighborhood community. You know, if I were to summarize the 40 days of community in just word, one word, it would be this, love. 40 days of community is all about love. Loving the people in your small group, loving the people in your church, and loving the people in the community around your church, in your neighborhood. You see, without love, nothing else matters. We're going to look at this. It's all pointless if we're not learning to love, because that's the greatest lesson in life. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit of what it's about. And also, I should say, there is still time to sign up. If someone's thinking of that, contact Tina Newfeld, and you can still sign up for that. It's not too late. And so, I will call the worship team up this morning. Well, good morning. I'm just going to open uh, with... Uh our time here singing with the word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this, this day that we've allowed us to get together. We were kind of wondering last night what would happen this morning, but you made a way for it to just be a beautiful morning for us. And I just pray, Lord, that you'd uh, be with us through the rest of this week too. But Lord, this morning that we'd just be able to worship you together and just feel that, feel your presence, Lord, that you would give us peace and knowing that you are in control of all these things in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. If you could sound with us, we're going to sing a few songs. These are the days of Elijah. Great trial of famine and darkness and 
Sing with me how great is our God And all will see how great, how great is our God You were the Word at the beginning
comprehend him yet he calls you by name oh man that hit me I was doing dishes this week you hear that you might have grown up in church and heard that that the king of the universe calls you by name but when it actually gets into you and you realize it me he sees me Lauren he calls me by name he calls you by name it's our prayer this morning that that you have that aha moment because it just leads you to worship. What can you do with that but worship? This amazing King of Kings, Lord of Lords, this master of it all. Praise the Lord. You can see it. Just need a couple of volunteers to come and take the offering this morning, and the plates are right here. Thanks, guys. Lord, again, we thank you for your many blessings to us, for the riches you've given us in this land, and we just pray that you would take these gifts and give back to you and use them for your spreading your gospel this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come here and worship you and for the freedom we have in this country to do so. And we think of those who are in countries where they risk everything just to meet and worship you. And we think of them this morning and pray for them and uh, give them strength, Lord, and give us humility and, and respect for what they go through, not to take for granted what we have in this land. We thank you, Lord, for so much this morning, even the snow on the ground, which we needed, and uh, 
the uh, beautiful day that we have and uh, to worship you this morning. For each one who's made it out this morning, uh, for those who couldn't make it, just uh, minister to them this morning, whichever way that they are hearing your gospel this morning. And as your gospel goes out across this land and through the airways, I just pray that that people would be receptive to you, that we would that we would turn to you, that your church would turn to you and, and be an example, a light on the hill for the world. We think of our pastor who is still away and give him traveling mercies, refresh him. And we are, are thankful this morning that we have a speaker that is bringing a message from you this morning, Lord, and we just ask that you would uh, give him the words to say and maybe be mindful and attentive to what you have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, yeah. Is my mic on? Oh, yeah. thank you. Can I have a little more of my vocal in this? Yeah, so um, I'm just going to keep it simple. We all need to remember that we know what the truth is, and this song is called Truth Is. But that don't change the truth Consult your daily horoscope But that don't change the truth You can read the lines in your hands But that don't change the truth Lead a march with a big old sign But that ain't gonna change the truth Truth is That God is in control Truth is His love will make you whole Jesus is the light, the way Give Him your heart for peace today what the truth is That it's okay, but that don't change the truth Find someone to agree with you, but that don't change the truth You can justify and rectify, but that don't change the truth Make up a seal-tied alibi, but that ain't gonna change the truth Truth is that God is in control Truth is His love will make you whole Today, that's what the truth is.
All right. So this morning we're fortunate to have Chris Toth with us who made the snowy trip down last night. And uh, he's going to bring us a message this morning. Thank you, Chelsea. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you. Those of you who have come in extra and those of you who are watching by Facebook and YouTube later on, good to be with you to worship today. And it's a privilege to bring you the word. So, unbeknownst to you, you're helping out. And this is Chelsea's fault. So just so you know, i got to blame somebody for this. So I'm going to prime you first. Let's do the great coffee survey. How many of you need to live with coffee every day? Just show of hands. Excellent. Good. Now, those of you who don't live by coffee every day, you are safe before you get that second cup. Show of hands. The, the group of you is much smaller. Let's go back to you coffee people. How many of you are cream and sugar? Give me a yes. yes. There's, there's a yes. Now, do you go as far as the Wayne Gretzky, the nine and nine? <laughs> no, no. Okay, good. What's the ratio? Uh, double, double. Double, double. There you go. Okay, so those of you who are coffee drinkers, but not double, double drinkers, what's the right ratio? Do you take sugar or do you take cream? Who are the sugar people? Oh, there's one. How many do you need? Three. Three sugars. Oh, we're still getting close to cough syrup. <laughs> Excellent. Those of you who are cream people, how much does it take? Two. There we go. That's getting close to a latte. Three. Very much close to a latte. Excellent. You guys are great at this. You know how to respond. This is awesome. So let's now move away from coffee and... Let's talk about who you have heard preaching up here since Pastor Charlie's been on holidays. So, who have you had in the last few weeks? Josh, Josh excellent. And what did Josh preach on? Speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues. Excellent. And who is after Josh? Benji and Jail. And what did they share about? A testimony of healing in their child. Excellent. Good. Am I missing anybody? Okay, you guys are doing great at this. Look at this. We've done, we've done what you drink in the morning to get you going. We have covered the, the preaching you've heard in the last few weeks. This is good. You have memories. You know how to get going every day. Now we want to engage in God's word and get ready to respond those of you who have been Sunday school teachers, I am going to need your help. Those of you who have read through your Bible, I'm going to need your help so that we make this go quick. Otherwise, you have to put up with me going on and on. So, before we do that, let's pray. Lord, your word is about engaging us as your people. Lord, we know that you want us engaged in every day. That's why you give us coffee to wake up. Lord, thank you for those ones who are already gifted at being aware of their surroundings even before the coffee passes by them. And Lord, more than that, we want to thank you that you've given us the promise of your manifest presence showing up in our lives through the Holy Spirit. And you give us testimonies of how you work in our lives here and today. And so, Lord, today as we look at your word, may we be engaged to see how your presence fuels us and makes us aware for every day. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, I've bothered you. Let me tell you how Chelsea has bothered me. He called me up the other day to preach, and he goes, so Chris... What do you do now? Why did you ask that, Chelsea? My life's become a bit of a mystery. For about 20 years, I uh, rightly went by the title reverend. I still go by the title reverend, but I just, I don't have a regular sort of church like this to work in right now. So uh, in about the last three years, Marla and I moved back from uh, Eston, Saskatchewan, to the Langbank area, 
and I've been engaged in the family farm, and Marla and I have both been doing pulpit supply in churches in the area, and this one being one that's welcomed us back multiple times. And um, a year ago, my winter was very difficult. Because you don't farm much wheat in the snowbanks. Not that we had snowbanks last winter. So I spent time on EI by a fishing hole. I caught about 500 perch at Kenosi Lake, and that was awesome. And one day at Kenosi Lake, one of the guys I used to know from Kipling, I saw him out ice fishing, and I said, I got a bone to pick with you. And he goes, oh, I haven't seen you in nine years. What, what did I do wrong? And I said, I applied for a job at the Air Cedar factory, and nobody's looked at my resume. So that opened the door to now I am a production supervisor on the night shift at Vatterstad, and we build the Cadillac of air seeders, and if anybody is looking for a job, I need employees. <laughs> so just to put that little plug out there, I hope this is okay with the top brass. Hopefully somebody in Sweden is watching me, but seriously, there is opportunity in this country. Man, is there opportunity. Not just in our manufacturing force, not just in growing crops and feeding the world, but there is an opportunity of harvest in the spiritual. Have you ever asked yourself why a preacher preaches? Why does a preacher preach? Give me a couple answers. Lead people to the Lord. Lead people to the Lord. Okay, that's a good one. What's another? Why else does a preacher preach? To learn the word. To, yeah, to learn the word. Who do you think does the most learning? The preacher. the preacher. That's right. That's right. You guys just get the edge of what we've gone through. Why else does the preacher preach? To remain in the word. To remain in the word. Yeah. Yeah. It's a calling to help us grow. This is a process of life change for the one who is doing it and for the hearer. The scripture tells us this. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. This is not just for entertainment. This isn't just to hold tradition. This is for life change and action. The scripture has always been about life change and action. So let's talk about the action your life takes. And since we are in Western Canada, we most identify ourselves by what we do. I've told you what I do. I want to know what you do. Chelsea asked me this question. It's his fault. <laughs> What are some of your professions out there? Where do you work? What are your business names? Tell me. I'm interested. I want to know. Where do you come from? Where do you engage life every day? Well, I'm a mom. A mom. Hey. Excellent. That, that takes, uh, what, what do we call that? A domestic engineer? Yeah, that's, one, that's the, the professional title. Uh, to the kids, it's, what's, what's for dinner? What can I eat? Yeah. That's awesome. The person who protects the peace of the home. That is awesome. Moms. Great. That's a wonderful profession and calling. What other jobs and businesses do we have out there? I preach to broken trucks. <laughs> <laughs> preach to broken trucks. We got, a, we got a mechanic, a truck doctor, a metal doctor in our midst. That's awesome. What else do we have, got happening? Got any business names? Any business owners in our midst? Yeah, there we go. G3, excellent. Things are better in threes, even Gs. Excellent, good. We got the, the keeping of homes and keeping people in shelter. That's great. How many employees? Three, four, yeah, yeah, excellent. Any of you work in a, in a, in a business or a, or a company where there's maybe five to 20 employees? Yeah? Where do you work? Tri-Can. Tri-Can. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we see them all over the place in the oil patch and 
and hauling stuff all over the, world, the, the countryside. That's excellent. Anybody else in that sort of engaged world? A coal mine. Yeah. How many people there? Yeah. There's a purpose to this question. I'm going to get there. There's a purpose to this. So we've got moms. I'm guessing then we got dads. Uh, we have farmers in our midst. We got mechanics. We have carpenters. We have uh, those. What do you do at TriCan? There you go. We got truck drivers. Shouldn't you be in Ottawa right now? <laughs> Truck drivers, excellent, good. We got truck drivers. This is, this is what we need. Do we have uh, business owners? Any of you own farms? Yeah, there we go. That's business owners. You're impacting your world with farms. I am so excited to get into the family farm. That is, uh, man, to be entrepreneurial and bring blessing to your world through what God gives you and what other generations have built up, man, that's a privilege. We get to feed the world. That's incredible. You get to serve the world. Moms, you're preparing people to enter and impact the world. Mechanics, keep the world going. Right? Like, do you see the purpose that God has woven through everything we do? Kids, Teenagers, any of you gas jockeys? Is it, nobody? Stocking shelves at the grocery store. Babysitting, anything. Throw me a bone. Do you guys do anything? Do you mow lawns? Come on. You got to do, you are going to start engaging your world with purpose. That's awesome. No matter what you touch, God is giving you purpose. To touch your world. Let's talk about this old world. I'm going to take you to the book of Daniel, just in your memory. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Sunday school teachers, this is where I need you to shine. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, a dream about a statue. The statue was made out of uh, five different materials. Starting at the head, what was the statue made of? Gold, excellent. Next was silver. silver. Then was bro bronze. Bronze, good. Yeah, just think the Olympics. We got through the Olympics. Good. And then after the Olympics is done, in this piece here, we have iron. Iron, good. And then the feet are two items mixed together that don't mix well. Clay and iron. Clay and iron. You guys did great. Four out of five. Perfect. That's an 80%. Good. So God gives Nebuchadnezzar this dream to show Nebuchadnezzar the way that the, the, the empires of humanity are going to move. They're going to move from the gold standard to the silver standard to the bronze standard to the iron standard of hardship and then to a standard that doesn't mix well. And the empires of this world will get worse as time goes on. What ends up happening to the statue? It gets smashed. Smashed by what? A stone. And what happens to the stone? The stone becomes a mountain that becomes the place where all the people of the earth come to recognize the Almighty One. We're going to talk about the stone today. And let's just recognize this, because we need to talk about what's happening in our world. God's given us a purpose. God's given us a place to engage our world. You have been challenged that you need to be filled with the manifest presence of God. And you have been encouraged by the fact that God's presence impacts your world today, whether in healing or sharing his message and giving hope. And we are watching a world that is strung out that is at disorder. We are in a nation that is most at odds with each other that it's ever been. Read the news from Vancouver 
Ottawa or Toronto or blogs from those places versus places like Calgary, Regina, and uh, what's another place to pick? I can't pick a third right at the moment. But you hear the different voices in our country. We have disunity. Sounds like iron and clay. All these things, no matter what side you fall on, are going to be run over by the stone and replaced with a different kingdom. Yeah, I've got politics in this. My politics will shine. I have a thought about which way is right and which way is wrong. But those don't matter. Those don't matter if they don't serve the one who is coming to set up and establish an eternal kingdom in his presence with us. Do we need to fight for rights and freedoms? In a democracy, yes, that is our system. Doesn't matter what side of the floor you fall upon, you need to express what you believe, because that's how democracy works. But as Christians, we're not working for a democracy. We are looking for the manifest presence of God to come and live in the middle of our world, because that is the promise of world history given in the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will set up his kingdom and it will be better than whatever we can set up as humans. We need the presence of Almighty God in our midst. So let's talk about where the presence of God dwells. Okay, Sunday school teachers, I'm going to get you busy again. Genesis chapter 1, where was the presence of God? Over the waters, hovering over the chaos of earth. Exactly. Then what, where did the presence of God live in Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3? In the garden. In the garden. Who else was in the garden? Sorry, I heard it over here. I heard a murmur. Just say it a little clearer. Adam and? Adam and Eve. Yeah, well, Adam and the woman... She doesn't get named Eve till chapter 3. I'm sorry, I was just being exact on that one. Yeah, bringer of life, though. It's a great name. Great name. God's presence walking and dwelling with people, talking to them face to face. After Adam and Eve's sin, where does God's presence show up before the nation of Israel is established? If you think of Genesis and, and, and uh, up into the, into the first half of Exodus, where does God's presence show up? Pardon? Mount Ararat. Oh, yeah, Mount Ararat, where, uh, where Moses has his vision, or, or the burning bush, right? Sorry, Mount Sinai? In Sinai, yeah. Ararat is where uh, Noah meets up with God and gets the promise after the flood. Here, we can pull all sorts of mountains. What about Jacob? Where does he have the vision of the ladder? What does he name that place? Sorry? Bethel. Bethel. Yeah, the house of God. Bethel. Where does Melchizedek Where is he the priest king of? What city? Salem. Salem. Yeah, the city of peace. So God is dwelling in different places even before there's a temple. God is in this dwelling place where he's engaging with people at different times. One guy's a shepherd. One guy built a boat through a flood. Another guy is a priest and king. God is engaging. One guy's on the run. From his family. Wow, who does God engage with with his presence? That's a pretty broad swath. Pretty broad swath. After the Exodus, where does God's presence dwell? In a cloud, and where does a cloud move into? The tabernacle, a tent, 
a moving place of God's presence. And now we have this specific place between the cherubim, above the Ark of the Covenant, where the wings just about touch, where God's presence dwells. And once a year, a priest comes in to make sacrifice by blood to clean the people of their sin and himself of their sin. And it's a very restricted zone. God's presence still shows up in other places. People have dreams. There's priests and there's prophets that engage the presence of God. But by and large, to come to God's presence, the Holy of Holies, it's in a very restricted place. After the tabernacle, we get the built by Solomon, the temple. And the furniture from the tabernacle gets moved into the temple. And then who destroys the temple? Pardon? The Romans? The Romans? Ah, uh, oh, yeah, you're jumping ahead. Sorry, you're, you're one dynasty ahead of me. I wanted the Babylonians first because they destroyed the temple. And then Herod rebuilds it, right? And so we have the second temple, and that's... Oh, I could take you through some archaeology. You don't need that this morning. But we have the temple, and it gets destroyed. And as the Israelites are carried off into exile, they have Ezekiel, this prophet. And they have Isaiah, and they have Jeremiah. And this promise starts emerging. I will be your God. You will be my people. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will write my law on your hearts. So we're moving from God's presence being in this restricted place to this promise of God's presence coming and engaging us in the most inner, most part of our being. Let me ask you a church politicized question. You don't have to answer this one out loud, just to give you permission. And how many of you are comfortable with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues? I'm just going to bring this out here because I know it's been brought up. I'm glad you did because it's in the Bible. But the way we've treated it in church is we split it off for different groups. And so for some of us, it makes it uncomfortable. Some of us, it's the focus. I'd like to level the field just a little bit. Because when we start to understand that God's presence is destined and aimed to be in our innermost part, this doesn't have to be so mysterious. And it doesn't have to be something that we're kept away from. But it becomes a promise of engagement for God's purposes through us to touch our world. <clears throat> Folks, look me in the eye. You need God's presence. Benji? Yeah, no. Nope. Sorry, Benji. Josiah. Josiah, I'm sorry. I've done this with you before. <laughs> I've been telling other people today I've already getting na got names ready. You, you jumped ahead to where the temple veil was torn. Why is that so important? Ah, uh, great segue. God tore down the old system in order to establish the new one. Okay, so a quick recap to where we are right now. We've established that you folks do something and you become aware in your daily life to engage in the purpose that God has given you. Okay? Through your different jobs and you touch your world, no matter where it is. We see that human kingdoms are going to fall and get worse until the day that God sets up his kingdom. Book of Daniel. We see that God's presence has been dwelling with humanity, sometimes restricted, but with the promise to be in the innermost part of our being. 
So let's get to that promise. Wow, what a long introduction, eh? First Peter chapter two, verses four to six. Let's talk about where God's presence dwells now. First Peter chapter two, Peter writing to the early church, he is talking about where God lives now in light of the temple being destroyed and in light of uh, the Christians spreading out through the Mediterranean basin, where is the place that we engage God's presence? And he says this, As for you, come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. The temple used to be the place of God's presence dwelling. What is Peter telling us here? Who is the living cornerstone? Jesus. Who are the other living stones? Whoever believes in him. You know what that means? We are now the temple. We are the place of God's dwelling. There is no curtain between us and God. Once Jesus' blood has washed us of our sin and cleansed us of unrighteousness, the very presence of Almighty God comes to dwell in our midst. And He will be our God and we will be His people. And He will write His law on our heart. You are now the place where God's presence chooses to dwell in this world. Does it feel like that? Sometimes that can be tough. But that's the truth. The very presence of Almighty God has chosen to live in you. We are now the place of God's dwelling in in this world. John chapter 1 verse 14. It reads like this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth. We heard a song about truth. What was that line? Even if you're carrying a big old sign, it's not necessarily the truth. Oh, that's a good, good thing for today, just to keep us conscious and, and of what we're doing, right? But what is the truth? The glory of God has been revealed to us through Jesus. And God chooses to dwell in us. You know, the very place where the priests would come in and offer the blood sacrifice for the cleansing of sins. That presence lives in us when we receive Jesus as our Savior. That means the presence of God able to cleanse the world of sin travels with us because we've engaged with Jesus and we've seen him and he's revealed the Heavenly Father to us. The Holy of Holies is now portable and goes wherever you go. If you do laps, you're taking the Holy of Holies with you. Isn't that good news for youth group? I know you guys do laps, even at a buck 40 gas. (laughs) The presence of God is going with you. The opportunity to be set free from sin goes with you. The contact between heaven and earth no longer resides in a building. It resides in us. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, 
verses 6 to 8. So when they, this is the ascension, Jesus going to heaven and some of his final words as his followers are watching him as he, as he returns to heaven after his uh, time on earth, after his resurrection in the, in the time before Pentecost. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Look at this. His followers are looking for a kingdom. They want the right politics in place. Because they understand God's dwelling with the world through the nation of Israel. Ethnically centered. But that's not where it's centered. It's centered in faith and God's presence. That's where the kingdom of God is centered. Not in politics, but in faith. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The presence of God that cleanses sin also is the presence of God that empowers those of us who believe in him to go to the ends of the earth, not to preach an earthly kingdom, but to reveal Jesus who was crucified and died for our sins and fills us with his presence to empower us to share the story of forgiveness and peace and resurrection and new life with the world we have called, been called to touch. His presence is for you and without it we can't go out. Are you convinced yet? Where does God's presence dwell? In us. What's it for? What is God's presence in us for? Be light salt. So others can know. So we can know. Two promises here. We're going to get to it as we close in Hebrews chapter 10. But the presence of God is where we are refueled and reminded of how Jesus changes us. And the presence of God, as we go out, becomes the message of hope and peace and restoration for a world that needs it. It's got a purpose for us to change us, and it's got a purpose to change our world. So I want you to be convinced that God's presence, now no longer restricted by the temple curtain, goes wherever you go as a believer in Jesus Christ. Suck this in. The presence of Almighty God chooses to find a home and touch the world through you. Come on, me? How did you put that? At the dishpan? Me? He calls me. He calls you. He calls us. Who else is he calling? Who else is he calling? What does God want? He wants none to suffer wrath, but all to come to salvation. That's why his presence in you is so important. That's why the Holy Spirit manifests through you is so important. Not just for the gift of healing, not just for the gift of tongues, not just for the gift of understanding the scripture, but the gift to 
twist wrenches and change diapers and talk to people where they are at and to share with them that Jesus is for them because God's given you a purpose to engage your world and he has a fuel, a powerment for you to engage your world so people will know Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 12. Turn there with me, please. How easy is it for people to come to God's presence? Jesus re-establishes the playing field when he gives the Sermon on the Mount. And let's just talk for a moment about what the playing field is when Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount. The temple is still in place. And the Jewish people, their worship in their local communities exists around the synagogue, the, the place of teaching, and that's where the school was, and that's where people came and engaged the Torah, the law, and the prophets, and the Psalms. This is where they would sing worship together, and they would be taught and reminded of how to come to God. Who is in charge of those synagogues? You can answer this one. Who is in charge of those synagogues? What, what, what title do we give that group? Pharisees. The Pharisees. Who was their competition? They show up asking a question about resurrection. One wife and seven brothers. The Sadducees. Excellent. You guys are good. Give you the right cues. You guys are, you got all the right answers. I wish I was teaching you in college. This is awesome. Yeah, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were running the show. And the Pharisees in particular interpreted God's law in such a way so that the people of Israel wouldn't go back into exile. They didn't want to lose the temple where the presence of God dwelt again. So they read God's laws and then they put more laws in front of it and more laws in front of it and more laws in front of it until following God was really restrictive. And the people often wondered, could they draw close enough to God? Could they, were they worthy to come to God? Read John chapter 9 and see how the Pharisees are threatening to kick uh, the blind man's parents out of the synagogue and out of worship. They had that kind of power. But Jesus comes with the Sermon on the Mount and he talks about what it takes to engage the kingdom of God. What it takes to engage the place where God's presence dwells and has authority. And let's read the qualifications that, God, that Jesus gives the crowd. And he opened his mouth, Matthew chapter 5 verse 3, and taught them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when, you, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my, Jesus, account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Who is Jesus saying that can draw near to the presence and the kingdom of God? Do you know some folks who are poor in spirit? Have we seen a time when people feel as poor or as anxious or as agitated as they do now? How many people do you know that are waiting for funerals? 
to finish the mourning process. How many people are trying to find out what is right in a world that has become so twisted? How many people are looking for peace, but out of victimization lashing out either side? Right? How many people want to be pure in heart and are looking for any way to get there? Do you know anybody who wants to be spiritual or mindful or do a little mix of Yoda and Buddhism? And, did I say Yoda? Yoga and Buddhism and, and maybe throw in some Christian principles. Like, this is our world. These people really do seem like the furthest away from God and Jesus is saying, the door is open to you. I work in a factory. I'm in charge of roughly 20 people. Very few believers. Great people. A lot of them are young guys under the age of 30. My dad would tell you from working with me on the farm I barely know the right end of the wrench to put on a nut. And I'm building farm equipment. Still the best air seeders <laughs> built. They're Cadillacs. What's my job? I get to coach these guys up. I get to give them hope. I get to engage with them the principles of Scripture. And they're my church. And there's no cross there. And sometimes they're in my office because their world is unraveling. And we sit down for an hour and a half and we talk about how their life can change and where they can find hope. Who do you engage when you drive a truck? Not many people, but there's got to be one or two when you stop. Moms, how many lives are you setting up? Mechanics, how many people are coming with stuff that's broken that need a bit of hope? Eaves trough people, how many people that are drips that you can give some good direction to? Farmers, how many people need more than bread on their table? Let's tie this together. The presence of God dwells in you and this makes the access to the kingdom of heaven very open. Because Jesus said so. God's desire to dwell in you. And the way he's opened up the kingdom to everybody gives us opportunity to see the kingdom. Farmers, why do you put seed in the ground? To multiply. to multiply. What? You don't want it just to rot there? A little green isn't good. You know that green shine across the field and the dew hits it? That's, an odd, that's a pretty picture. That doesn't do it? No, it's about a full bin. Why does a king have a kingdom? To fill it with people. King Jesus looks at the people of this world as his inheritance. That's why he gives you his presence where sin can be dealt with, with the good, where the goodness and the power of God and the resurrection power of Jesus Christ can be engaged in. He pours it into you and he makes a way for this world to be touched by his kingdom and the whosoever can come in. Do you see a harvest yet? Do you see a harvest? Let's finish up in Hebrews. Sorry, kids. I know I complain about this every now and again, but I'm using a lot of scripture today. I'm usually a stick in one place. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to finish up here. 
Hebrews 10 and Matthew 28. What do we do with this? God's presence dwells in us and God has made it easy and leveled the playing field for people to come into his kingdom. So what should our response be? Hebrews chapter 10, let's start here. Let's start with us. How do we need to engage God's presence? Hebrews 10 verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. How are we engaging in God's presence? Not by how good we are, but because Jesus is faithful, he brings us in. By his blood sacrifice, by our confession of faith, joining in baptism, we get to engage in God's presence. So gather together, and the presence of God in you, the, the Holy Spirit filling you and empowering you, encourage one another, stir each other up to see the harvest to see God's power work in your needs, to give you hope to go out to your world. Come near each other temple of God where God's presence dwells and be made whole on a regular basis. Be encouraged in the word on a regular basis. Get sight for the harvest. You know what I love about sitting with my dad over a cup of coffee? We talk about how are we going to plant the ground? And what are we going to sell? And how are we going to plan for the next year? Because there's a harvest to take. And yeah, there's fixing to do. And I got stones to pick, which I hate. And stumps to remove, which I hate. And old machines, which I try not to hate so much because then it's easier to drive them. We got stuff like that. It's not easy, right? Life's not easy. But when we talk encouraging each other towards the harvest, we can engage it and we fuel each other to do better as we share wisdom and gifts with each other. That's what church is, folks, not a building. Us engaging in God's presence with the gifts to fuel each other on. Your pastor has been gone and the people from your church have been teaching you and sharing God's word with you. How good is that? You know how many churches would kill? Kill, like literally kill to have somebody help out the pastor. That's awesome. Keep doing that. Why do we build each other up? Because there's a purpose. Matthew 28. And anybody who has a missions degree needs to bring this up in a sermon at least once. My master's is in intercultural ministries. Here is one of the most important verses, set of verses you will ever hear. Matthew 28, starting in verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. <clears throat> Let 
Let's recap. Some of you get going without coffee. Others of you need coffee because you all have a purpose to engage your world. And you engage that world with the presence of God dwelling in you because Jesus has made it easy for so many to approach his kingdom. So we gather together to fuel one another, to be encouraged in the presence of God, and then to go so that all the world might hear that Jesus is Savior and Lord. Should have just gone with that, right? How are you going to respond? I got a factory I work at. I'd love a few more people on my shift to bring Jesus with them. I can't be everywhere all the time. I've got a couple guys I can't connect with. The one guy thinks I have three left hands and four right thumbs. I need somebody to share the presence of Jesus with. But I'm talking to people who have already been given purpose. Who are you going to share the presence of Jesus with? You have a harvest. And even though there's snow on the ground, the season's now. In a moment, the worship team's going to come and close our service but I want you to stand with me and I want to pray with you. <clears throat> Lord, I want to thank you for this uh, welcoming church. Father, thank you for our connection over the years and uh, Lord, thank you for their patience. We took quite a journey today. But Lord, it's true. You really desire to live with us. Lord, for those of us here where you feel distant to them, where they, that understanding that your very presence is for them, Lord, I pray that they would have Lauren's revelation, that the Almighty King of Heaven calls them by name and desires them. And that even by coming to faith in you shows that the door has been opened and you have made the way for them to engage your presence. Lord, for the downhearted, for those needing encouragement, I pray for their fellow believers who you have tasked to come alongside and to share your word and to pray over them and to reveal your manifest presence when they need a hand up. Lord, may there be encouragement in this place. Lord, for our brothers and sisters watching online, would you give them engagement with one or two believers face to face that help them recognize and know that your presence is near them and in them. And then God, in the places where you've given us purpose, would you open the door for us to invite a mourning, broken-hearted, peace-seeking, righteousness-needing world to your presence and your salvation through Jesus. Holy Spirit, empower us to share boldly in the places where we live and work your kingdom so that people would be discipled to follow you. Lord, give us eyes to see a harvest. And Lord, thank you that we're not restricted by physical buildings as to who we can minister to. We are restricted only by the amount of people we can engage with. Lord, empower us to share salvation well with a world that needs it. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters as you give them purpose. 
Lord, may they see your kingdom come in their midst. And as we wait for your kingdom to come and manifest power and replace the brokenness of this world, till that day, help us be faithful to you. In your name we pray. Amen. God inhabits the praises of his people, and I think that that's what we just need to do this, uh, this uh, morning here, just that we're going to all go um, our separate ways, but we can just leave here with uh, feeling the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Or two or three are gathered in his name and agree together yeah. that he is there in our midst. And I just think that we just need to sing this song and just mm -hmm. praise God for who he is and feel that presence that he has and that peace that's in it. Thou, O Lord, our high above this uh, morning again and we're just still thankful for your presence Lord if there's uh, anyone here that needs has a need this morning that they just come forward Lord for prayer that that's what uh, you're all about is to be there for us and Jesus I just pray that uh, you'd go on our way protect us on our drives home and, um, and all that we do in Jesus name Amen